In the practice of magic, the power of language is far beyond that of simple signification and communication. For the sorcerer, language is a metaphysical bridge between various registers of reality, binding and changing them through the force and will of the magician. Though, just how that's supposed to work, just what the causal mechanism behind magic is, remains contested and often theoretically underdeveloped. One of the clearest theoretical and practical accounts of the role of language in the practice of magic is found, unsurprisingly, in Cornelius Agrippa's three books of occult philosophy, specifically in the final chapters of the first book. In this episode, I want to explore Agrippa's occult philosophy of language and magic. If you're interested in magic, hermetic philosophy, or mysticism, make sure to subscribe and check out my other content on topics in esotericism. Also, if you want to support my work of providing accessible, scholarly, and free content on topics in esotericism here on YouTube, I hope you'd consider supporting my work on Patreon or perhaps with a one-time donation. You can find those links below, and I really appreciate your consideration of supporting this channel and the project of Esoterica. Now, let's turn to one of the greatest works on occultism ever produced, Agrippa's Three Books. I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and welcome to Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion. Cornelius Agrippa's De Occulta Philosophia Libri Tres could just as well be entitled Summa Magica, as it is one of the most complete and systematic accounts of magical theory and practice ever produced in history. In fact, I would recommend taking a look at my general introduction to the occult philosophy of Agrippa in the episode linked in the card above. It'll help lay some of the historical groundwork for the more philosophical exploration of this episode. In the occult philosophy, Agrippa lays out a highly developed account of the metaphysics of the occult by proceeding systematically through three distinct registers of reality. The terrestrial world, our world, the celestial world, the world of the stars, and the super celestial world, the world of the divine. For Agrippa, the human being is the intersection of these three realities. And because of there being this central nexus, the Magus has the ability to commune and manipulate especially this register of reality, the terrestrial world, our world, through various magical practices. Central to that magical work is the role and power of language to call forth, bind, and infuse our register of reality with both the power of their will, but also the power of the superior astral realm and the intelligences therein, and even beyond that, the power of the divine. Of course, the concept of the power of magical words and incantations is a basic commonplace in magic. I think most children will know the ancient quasi-Aramaic abracadabra which actually might mean something like, I create as I speak, though the origin is admittedly mysterious. But Agrippa really situates the power of language and magic within a much larger systematic framework. However, for the purposes of this episode, I want to isolate his occult philosophy of language, but to do so, let's first turn to his philosophy of mind. Agrippa inherits a rather orthodox philosophy of mind from the inheritance of Islamic commentators of Aristotle, especially Ibn Sina and Ibn Rushd, or Avicenna and Averroes, respectively, mostly filtered through Thomas Aquinas. Here we have the human body composed of a ratio of the four simpler corporeal bodies, that is to say earth, air, fire, and water, with the honor of the affects spread through the body in a spectrum of dignity. 
from the head, which is magnified and glorified by reason, to the more meaner extreme regions of the body, such as the stomach or the extremities. Contra Aristotle and the Stoics, who maintain that the soul or mind is actually located in the heart, Agrippa locates it in the head, with the senses being divided between inner and outer senses. The classic five senses, sight, hearing, taste, smell, and touch, track to their respective nobility and power so as to be located in various parts of the body. While the inner senses are said to be f divided into four, kinda, and those divisions are also divided into various faculties. The four are the faculties of representation or common sense, which unifies the data flowing from our outer senses into a coherent representation of reality. The imaginative faculty, which constructs novel representations from the common sense or from memory, which is in fact the fourth faculty. It's the third, however, that's most key in our discussion and for Agrippa. And that's the faculty of the fantasia, or the inward sense, which does a range of mental work, including forming judgments or diagnosing truth claims. Now, when I said there are four faculties, kinda, I said that because Agrippa also marshals this faculty to serve as the place of intellection, or the fantastical intellect, as it might be known, which connects the soul to the mind, and thus to the supernal realms. This faculty receives and makes impressions from the tripartite soul. This idea obviously goes back to at least Plato, though it's been, by the time it gets to Agrippa, filtered through two millennia of hella complicated intellectual development, but this is a part of us that communes with the superior powers of both the astral and the divine realm. The soul for Agrippa, again, following a relatively orthodox medieval model, has itself three faculties. The appetitive part of our soul, which inclines it to its natural end. You can think of the desire for nutrition or sex. The second is the realm of the affects of positive and negative emotions. And finally, the intellective part of the soul, which serves as the ground for the will itself and further connects the mind or the passive intellect with the quasi-divine active intellect. Now, you're probably wondering about the exact distinction between the mind and the soul. Well, you can just go get in line with the rest of us who've been wondering about that exact relationship for about 2,000 years or something. The history of philosophy, beginning with Plato and especially Aristotle, has proven incredibly vague on this account. Did you hear that bit a second ago about how our mind is called the passive intellect, which communes with a quasi-divine, eternal, and separate active intellect? That concept emerges from what must be the single most perplexing few sentences in all of Greek philosophy from Aristotle's De Anima, Book 3, Chapter 5, Lines 4, 30a, 10 through 25. What amounts to a paragraph of Aristotle became a mountain of interpretation in the millennia that followed, and no one to this day has any real sense of what in the hell Aristotle was talking about. Honestly, Agrippa's account here is pretty vague and more than a little hand wavy, but the material he's dealing with is already a mess, and it wouldn't be until a century later when much of the inheritance of ancient philosophy of mind, at least at some level, would be shelved, with beginning with the 1641 Meditations on First Philosophy by Descartes, and eventually the uptake of such ideas into Immanuel Kant's Critique of Pure Reason, and eventually into contemporary phenomenology. Though, despite all those people that want to make a radical break between medieval thought and modern thought in the form of Descartes, I would actually argue that his concept of the natural light of reason is kind of the active intellect repackaged or at least entering into its philosophical half-life. But that's, a, that's an argument for another day. After a discussion of the emotions or the passions, which Agrippa divides into 11, actually probably again following Thomas Aquinas, in fact, Agrippa leans really heavily on Thomas Aquinas in much of these sections, and in fact through the entire three books of occult philosophy. 
Here he argues how the passions can make such an impression on the other faculties of the mind and, by extension, the physical body, that these impressions can be so strong that they can lead to physical distress, such as the fear of heights causing someone to tremble uncontrollably, but also even cases of death from extreme despair or joy. Further extreme rage can, according to Agrippa and various quasi-historical accounts that he cites, cause fire or even a lightning to emerge from the body, which sounds totally awesome. This actually reminds me of a tale in the Talmud where Shimon bar Yochai is said to have emerged from years of isolation hiding from the Romans in a cave, whereupon he emerged and his fierce judgment of what he took to be all the religious slackers around him caused burning rays to shoot forth from his eyes. Well, after killing a bunch of people with his judgy laser eyes, he returned to the cave and calmed down a bit before allegedly re-emerging and composing the Sefer Zohar or the Book of Radiance. So judgy laser eyes. Well, laser eyes aside, Agrippa turns his attention to the ability of the mind to supervene upon the body, including other bodies other than your own more generally. A mundane example of this would be how we have fear inside of dreams that causes our body to sweat or tense up. But Agrippa extends this to the ability of, for instance, witches to hex others by intense hatred and a steadfast eye. And here we have a causal explanation for the infamous idea of the evil eye. Further, such intense projections of the mind or soul can be amplified via astral power by timing such effective projections with astrological alignments. So projections of anger could be amplified by Mars or intense study could be amplified by the effects of Saturn. Of course, such projections could also be dampened by astral alignments as well. Though his general point here is to establish that mental and spiritual causation upon bodies is real at both mundane and super mundane levels. And this is truly key. His entire theory of magic rests on the reality of mental, spiritual, and astral causation acting upon physical bodies, especially when that causation is the result of the will of the magus. What Agrippa is doing here reveals his profound genius. He's using rather orthodox medieval philosophies of mind to rather unorthodox ends, or at least unorthodox for that time. He's using them as the very foundation for his theory and practice of magic. And indeed, the final chapters of book one of the three books is perhaps the most decisive for his general theory of magic. Here he spells out how the three metaphysical realms are causally linked and that magic is causing change specifically at the terrestrial register by invoking celestial and super celestial powers through various symbols, gestures, language, talismans, etc. Such greater powers impress themselves upon inferior powers and the nexus of all of this is the mind and soul of the magus which serves as a conduit through which such powers are projected. That's why, after all, this philosophy is an occult philosophy. Such connections which causally bind the various registers of reality aren't apparent to the five external senses. They are hidden, are occult. This is why I think it would be better to think of this vast tome not as three books of occult philosophy, but rather, right, the philosophy here isn't being occulted. Agrippa is literally writing a book to clarify it. Rather, it is three books of philosophy of the occult, or that which is hidden, namely the causal connections which bind the levels of reality by which the magus changes that reality, which is, you guessed it, just what we call magic. Also, it's worth pointing out here that Agrippa relies heavily on a fragmentary work of Proclus called De Sacrificio et Magica, translated by Copenhaver as On the Priestly Art. 
while the Corpus Hermeticum gets all the play for reigniting interest in all things Hermetic, you can check out my episode on those Hermetic texts in the card above, this small fragment of Proclus basically laid down the groundwork for all of Renaissance magic and Western magic since. In fact, it's so important that I'll be doing an entire episode about just that fragment of Proclus. Really, I find Proclus endlessly fascinating. If I could do an Esoterica book club, the first text that I'd want to read would be Proclus's Elements of Theology. But again, that's a story for another day. After this decisive input from Proclus's De Sacrificio et Magica, which establishes the causal nexus which links the various metaphysical realms and underwrites their manipulation through magical practice, Agrippa reveals the central key of this practice, the use of magical language. For Agrippa, language is an extension of our intellection, that part of our mind or soul which connects us to the celestial and supercelestial realms, with words, signs, and characters being the vehicle, vehicula, to use his language, really it's Proclus's language, but whatever, by which the powers of those realms flow through the magus, thus impacting the terrestrial realm. Language is an externalization of that connection to the higher, more powerful realms. These ideas originate, at least in the philosophical literature, in places like Plato's Critolus, but they are systematically presented in terms of magic and antiquity in Iamblichus's On the Egyptian Mysteries. Again, this all shows Agrippa's vast breadth of knowledge. He is able to synthesize this stuff into one coherent magical system. Languages are, for Agrippa, divided into natural and artificial. Artificial languages are those in which the relationship between the sign and the signifier is arbitrary. You can think of contemporary semiotics, since Saussure, where there is no metaphysical link between a being and the linguistic unit used to represent that being. For instance, the sound house, domus, oikos, or bait don't strike modern semiotics as metaphysically connected to the place in which you live, your house. However, Agrippa isn't a student of Saussure, and thus also admits of what he calls natural language, where the relationship between sign and signifier is metaphysically linked. In natural languages, there exists what he calls proper names, which bear a direct linguistic ontological connection between sign and signifier. By knowing the proper name of a thing, one can manipulate that thing through the use of language as connected via the will of the magus as connected to the celestial and supercelestial realms. Further, this is also how charms and incantations work, which Agrippa seems to think are more powerful if they're put into verse rather than in prose. Indeed, the very breath of the magus on which such magic power rides are said to bear supernatural power. If you've ever blown on dice before casting them, that natural 20 that you rolled three times in a row might really have been the result of such magical protected breathing. Though Agrippa is also rather clear that intention and belief are required for the flow of power through the magus to be effective. It's as if disbelief acts as a kind of blockage for the flow of the magical power, and thus intention, will, faith, and sincere belief in the operation are keys for its success, for it to flow from the super celestial or celestial realms through the magus, you have to believe, open yourself up to the possibility that it will flow, otherwise your disbelief acts as a kind of blockage, and thus the effects of the magic won't bear on the terrestrial realm. But, according to Agrippa, all languages aren't completely equal. For him, the natural language was also the primeval language spoken by Adam in Paradise, and the language closest to that is Hebrew. Indeed, Agrippa believes that the Hebrew letters themselves are a reflection of the stellar array. They're literally written in the heavens, and Hebrew itself is a kind of starry language best suited for magical operations more generally. Here, Agrippa leans heavily on the proto-Kabbalistic text, the Sefer Yetzirah, a text which had long linked the 22 Hebrew letters and the 10 numbers 
to the speech act creation of God of the entire cosmos. Now you might begin to understand why all those magical diagrams you've seen tend to contain some Hebrew, those found in Agrippa's Trace Libri all the way down to the infamous cycle of Baphomet. Though Hebrew already had a place in Western magic prior to Agrippa, but it certainly became philosophically cemented in the three books. Also, if you want to learn more about the mysterious Sefer Yetzirah, you can check out my episode on it in the card above. However, it should be pointed out that Agrippa doesn't grant magical power exclusively to Hebrew. In that the other languages are, in some sense according to him, descended from Hebrew via the whole Tower of Babel bit, especially the more ancient ones still retain some of this magical power. This may also explain the predilection for some magical practitioners to prefer to use incantations, for instance in Latin, like in all those movies, especially if their Hebrew is a bit rusty. Latin, being more ancient than, say, English, is closer, in his theory at least, to Hebrew, and thus shares a bit more of its primordial magical power. In order to facilitate such magical practices, Agrippa actually provides a little handy chart with Hebrew, Latin, and Greek alphabets along with their zodiac and chiromantic correspondences. Though, while most of the Greek pair up basically well, this is not echoed in the Hebrew alphabet whose order is completely puzzling to me. In fact, this entire chart doesn't really make much sense and frankly seems rather garbled or scrambled. Perhaps the printer didn't really put it together properly. I can't imagine this is a mistake that Agrippa made. In addition to the Hebrew alphabet, Agrippa also provides several other magical alphabets in book three of the three books, three of which are actually based on Hebrew and are found in texts of Jewish astrological magic, but in some sense actually stretch all the way back to the ancient Greek magical papyri. If you're interested in the history of those symbols, check out my episode on that topic in the card above. Though just how these magical alphabets mesh up with his earlier remarks about the natural magical power of Hebrew in book one isn't really clear. In fact, they just seem kind of thrown in for good measure, but they have proven incredibly popular with practitioners in the centuries that followed the publication of Agrippa's three books. Agrippa ends his first of the three books of occult philosophy discussing the effective power of the Hebrew language before turning to book two, where he will develop his theory of occult mathematics, a topic for a future episode, I'm sure. Agrippa's philosophy of magic and language are a fascinating synthesis of millennia of magical theory and practice incorporating elements from a wide range of practices, from pagan ancient philosophy to Jewish Kabbalah to Agrippa's own intense Christian hermeticism. I'm sure I'll be exploring the philosophy of the occult further in the future. What emerges in this book is a fascinating philosophical analysis of metaphysics, magic, language, mathematics, and much more cementing Agrippa's genius at both synthesis and innovation. If you want some more book recommendations on Agrippa more generally, check out my episode on his three books of occult philosophy in the description below. I also have to admit that I haven't had the chance to look at the new Eric Perdue translation of the three books, but I'm really looking forward to getting it and I've heard good things. Again, make sure to subscribe, check out my other content, and consider supporting my work of making scholarly and free content on topics in esotericism by taking a look at my Patreon or perhaps considering a one-time donation. Those links are below. Until next time, I'm Dr. Justin Sledge, and thanks for watching Esoterica, where we explore the arcane in history, philosophy, and religion.